Thank you, Patrick. And we are good, thank you. Okay, sounds good. Um, so welcome everybody. I'm Kimber McKay and I'm a faculty member here in the School of Public Health and also the Director of Global Public Health. And I'm happy to introduce our speaker um, in our speaker series for this week, um, somebody who I've known for a long time, who is actually a graduate student of mine years ago, Katherine Sanders. And so Catherine earned her PhD in medical anthropology here at the University of Montana in 2012. And for the past 15 years, she has designed and conducted mixed methods research, impact monitoring and evaluation, and learning for service organizations that conduct work in the rural US, East Africa, and South Asia. She is director at Expanding Opportunities, an organization specializing in childhood education. She also teaches social sciences and as an adjunct at several higher education institutions. And her expertise is in health, innovation, agriculture, social networks and resources, education and risk-taking in rural parts of the global south. And her research experience includes long-term fieldwork in remote regions of the United States, Nepal, Kenya, and Uganda. And she has implemented monitoring and evaluation systems in the US, Nepal, and Uganda, and maintains contracts with the main CDC, Hassan University, and several other local nonprofits. So she currently lives in an off-grid cabin in the Maine woods with her husband, dogs, and chickens, and that's what inspired our recent musings about um, maple syrup and tapping those maple trees. <laughs> so Catherine, um, welcome to our seminar series, and I will let you take it away. Great, thanks so much, Kimber. It's great to be here. Uh, see a lot of familiar faces out there. I'll go ahead and share my screen and get started because I know I want to leave some time for questions. I'm going to be talking today about uh, an impact evaluation that I did in um, or that I led in East Africa, uh, specifically in Kenya. It was uh, what was termed a graduation program, which uh, is just a, a way of sort of countering the critique to international development that uh, inter international development too often leaves, you know, kind of drops projects in the midst of, of uh, impoverished regions and, uh, and then leaves them and they completely unravel. And so the graduation approach really takes, uh, takes that sustainability critique to heart and, uh, and attempts to uh, leave people in a place where they can uh, continue accessing the positive outcomes from those programs. Uh, this particular project was, uh, was designed by, uh, or used the, the BRAC USA model, uh, which was designed to lift the ultra poor, as BRAC called them, out of poverty. And, uh, and so it's aimed at sustainable livelihoods, uh, and, uh, but it does uh, approach that, uh, that livelihoods, those livelihoods outcomes from a position of um, a lot of uh, sort of holistic uh, aspects of health and livelihood. And so, um, so our impact evaluation was designed to measure those aspects as well. Uh, the program was headed up, it was funded by the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, and, uh, and in partnership with the government of Kenya, uh, and specifically their treasury department. And it was part of a much larger project uh, aimed at making uh, the microfinance and, and economic livelihoods systems in general uh, more accessible. And, uh, and so the other sort of component of the project that the, uh, that the Treasury Department had a big hand in was, uh, was, making, was uh, developing links and, and supporting the micro enterprise systems in Kenya so that they would be able to, uh, to deliver affordable loans uh, to smallholders and, uh, and people in remote regions of Kenya that otherwise didn't have access to those. And so, um, but our part of the project, our subcomponent, as it was termed, 
uh, dealt, uh, it targeted the most rural regions of Kenya and it was um, designed, you know, it targeted mainly women uh, and youth. And, uh, and so BOMA and CARE, as you see in the diagram there, they were the implementing partners in this, uh, in this project. Uh, BOMA project operated mainly in the pastoral regions with Samburu, mainly Samburu, uh, the Samburu ethnic group, uh, which are, uh, deal a lot, they do a lot of livestock keeping there. Those are their sort of main form of livelihoods. And, uh, and CARE was operating for this program in, uh, in sort of the central eastern region of Kenya uh, called Katui County. And that was a more of an agro-pastoral region, so uh, where people had a combination of agricultural and, and livestock-based livelihoods. BRAC was the technical assistance arm of the program. They were there to, um, to help implement their model to uh, provide guidance to BOMA and CARE as they, uh, as they tried to get businesses up and running uh, among the most vulnerable uh, parts of the population. And, um, but they were also in charge of the impact evaluation and that's what they contracted expanding opportunities to do was, uh, was evaluate their impact. Now, initially this program was designed to, as a pilot to be expanded. Uh, and so the impact evaluation was, uh, was, a, was intended, it became a quasi experimental design because they, um, they wanted to prove attribution to the project. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the elements throughout this talk that, um, you know, that came along as part of that deal. But this was a quasi-experimental design study with a control and a treatment group. Uh, and, um, and because of that had, um, it was, it had some, you know, maybe some more conclusions than we could have otherwise come, come to, but um, there were also issues with it. So what is the BRAC graduation model? Uh, a lot of it is in targeting. They have that, uh, the ultra poor uh, as their targeted audience uh, for interventions like this. And uh, in order to, uh, to figure out who the ultra poor are in a given region, they tend uh, to rely on a more sort of a relative uh, definition of wealth. So they would conduct participatory rural appraisals uh, in the regions where uh, where they were targeting, uh, this had basically um, two outcomes. One is that we would come away from those uh, PRAs with a uh, basically a ranking system for the, the entire community, uh, where you know uh, we could identify who were among the poorest of the poor. Uh, and, uh, but the other part of that was understanding what made up uh, poverty and wealth in the region. So um, uh, the, these PRAs would, would be just uh, hours and hours of involved discussions about what makes people uh, poorer or richer than others in the region. Uh, so the, the two pro implementing partners came away with really different sort of wealth models uh, because of this, and uh, but they were able to uh, relatively successfully identify the most vulnerable in the in the population. Uh, the asset transfer was really the meat and potatoes of this graduation model. So it was, um, you know, the whole idea was to uh, to create or collaborate to to form uh, sustainable livelihoods. Uh, and so it involved starting businesses or their approach was to start businesses among the participants in the program. And so, um, so it was an asset transfer or monetary transfer uh, equal to about $350 uh, US. And, uh, and so in most, biz in most of the parts of this study, or sorry, of the program, it ended up being uh, maybe small shops or uh, maybe they would buy livestock with, uh, with the money or um, obtain uh, other types of uh, assets that they could then build a business out of. 
and along with that, they brought in technical training. Uh, a lot of the, you know, the poorest of the poor in any given region, as you might imagine, uh, may not be totally literate and certainly don't have a lot of business skills. So the technical training piece was designed uh, to, to sort of, um, to get people to catch up to the curve uh, and be able to, uh, to do basic computations, uh, and even uh, just household management of resources was, was part of this technical training uh, so that uh, people would uh, sort of get an idea of how to manage both uh, the needs of your household and a business at the same time. A stipend, I have seen this be um, proposed for a lot of other graduation uh, models, but its, uh, its presence in the, in the BRAC graduation model uh, was really important for, uh, for the health of these businesses uh, because the stipend it amounted to about $15 per month given to participants and their families uh, intended to buy food or, um, or just day-to-day -day expenses uh, so that people wouldn't have to take from the profits of their business early on when they were still building that business. Uh, and so the stipend lasted for just six months and was discontinued after that uh, with the idea that the, the business would then be at that point that it could take over. Um, but BRAC also with its model recognizes that there are um, a lot of other competing demands on people's time, uh, namely health emergencies and, uh, and other threats to, uh, to human capital uh, as people are trying to start up new businesses. And so, uh, so they, they got to the heart of some of those issues with, um, a, in a couple of different ways. Uh, so they provided health support mainly in the form of membership in the National Health Insurance Plan, plan NHIF in Kenya, uh, which uh, I'll talk about a little bit more in a slide or two. Uh, and so they paid for their membership in there and also um, set up savings groups so that people could save to pay for national health insurance premiums uh, after the project was over. And then uh, it also worked on the prevention side of health and, uh, and got people mentoring in some of the common uh, diseases in the area. So um, wash mentoring, water sanitation and hygiene, uh, infectious diseases, especially HIV and malaria and other maternal, neonatal, child and reproductive health issues. They also focused a lot on, on female empowerment, both because of the targeting of the program, as well as, uh, as, as, well as some of the high rates of uh, gender-based violence in the regions targeted. Uh, and then finally, the last component was, uh, was about social integration. So beyond focusing on the participants in the program, they recognized that it's, uh, it's really key to be able to, uh, to get the health infrastructure and the, and the economic infrastructure to work uh, appropriately so that people can access uh, the services available. And, uh, and so they did a lot of liaising with uh, national health insurance people, as well as uh, the Department of Social Development and Economic Development in Kenya to get, uh, to get their participants access to resources and, um, and registration and things like that that would be necessary to operate a successful business. Yeah, so what, uh, what is this, uh, you know, how, where is this, this health support taking place in the context of, how, what is Kenya's health context? Um, we don't have time to go into all of it, but, um, but Kenya does have a goal of universal health coverage uh, by 2022. Uh, currently, they're, they're far short of that goal with, um, with only about 80% of the population with health insurance of any kind. Uh, and you can see that their expenditures on health are, um, are pretty comparable to those of the US. So the outer circle is Kenya, the inner circle is the US. 
uh, and uh, the extent to which public, uh, individual, private, and other resources uh, pay for health expenses. And, um, and so, and I think it was some, the last numbers that I saw were about 16% of uh, the Kenyan population had, had coverage under this uh, National Hospital Insurance Fund or NHIF as I'll be calling it throughout. Uh, what is what does that mean for people in the areas that uh, of the that were the same as uh, where the participants live for this program? This was a pretty typical uh, household setup for uh, participants in the regions where we worked. This particular one is from the Katui side of things, so the agro pastoral region. Uh, and people living in uh, the the areas where the study took place, were, um, you know, we're living really far from any uh, health clinic. So it usually involved a lot of walking to get to health clinics. Uh, and then people living out, uh, out there where they have to walk to health services like that may not have a lot of knowledge about uh, what kind of services are available once they get there. Uh, and so they may waste a lot of money and, and time trying to access services that uh, just aren't available to them. And of course, uh, this usually results in people not utilizing the system at all. And so the graduation program was also trying to get people hooked into the health insurance system um, and, and understanding its benefits better. And I think to a certain extent it did that, but it also highlighted the gaps that remain in that system because um, there are still a lot of places where the national health insurance uh, did not uh, did not cover or uh, where there were miscommunications about the benefits and, uh, and expenses involved. Uh, for our program, we did, like I said, it was a quasi-experimental -exper design uh, with a control and treatment group. Uh, that means we also had to do a baseline uh, along with an end line. Uh, and so, um, so kind of involved a lot of, uh, you know, some really massive, uh, operations to get uh, all the enumerators trained and um, and out to all these. Once again, we're targeting the most remote. So we um, so the the um, the household locations were not the most convenient uh, for us to get to. In fact, they were among uh, the the toughest to reach spots in Kenya. And so uh, so we had a variety of ways of trying to get out there, which involved uh, motorbikes and, uh, and multiple vehicle drop-offs and, and, um, and, but mostly lots of walking. Uh, and so uh, people enjoyed that more or less depending on <laughs> their preferences. I love this part of field work, but uh, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but the enumerators we worked with were, uh, were real troopers. Uh, they had to work extremely long days uh, and it wasn't easy to find uh, find households in these locations. And then we had to make sure we could find them again in two years when the study was over. Uh, so that was a big uh, issue with quality control for the study itself and, um, and one that I know weighed heavily on the enumerators. Uh, at the end of all this hiking around every day, we would have debriefs and quality checks uh, where we discussed the information we'd heard that day and uh, how to categorize it appropriately, how it fits into this questionnaire that we had created together uh, because uh, the enumeration training was really um, it was really a collaboration where uh, the enumerators lended their expertise to the tool itself. Uh, and they had really co-designed it uh, to make sure that, uh, that it made sense in the local language and, uh, and that the meanings that we were trying to get across were actually coming across. And so, um, and so we would, would make sure that we were staying true to that as the field work progressed um, and this was one, one way of doing that. 
We also ended up conducting a midline uh, to the survey, or sorry, a midline evaluation that was ended up being more of a performance evaluation. So rather than only trying to understand the impacts, the midline was aimed at uh, at getting to uh, what we could, what the or, uh, implementing organizations could do better, what they um, what they needed to work on, the, any gaps that they needed to fill. Uh, and so most of those ended up being uh, key informant interviews and focus group discussions. Uh, and as many of you know who may have uh, worked in this field before, that uh, it is really tough to get uh, people to say negative things about a program that they think that you're associated with, uh, especially in East Africa, where um, politeness, there's a high premium on politeness. And so, um, and so we uh, did our best uh, to, to elicit critiques, um, but we were met with a lot of celebration and, uh, and dancing was a, a part of a lot of those groups as well, which I thought was just wonderful and delightful. Um, but we did come away, we thought, with, uh, with some good information about why and how these programs were operating in people's lives. And I'll uh, discuss that in a moment as well. And anyone who's conducted field work also knows that a large part of quality control, and, uh, and especially if you're trying to do an experimental design study, uh, has to work around all the vehicle breakdowns and, uh, and the difficulties of finding people uh, and the waiting around for a ride. Uh, that accompanies uh, field work in any of those situations. And once again, our enumerators uh, made really good use of their time and, um, and ultimately confronted all of those challenges with aplomb. So um, the results I'll present here are from one of the regions in particular. Uh, we were more successful in the Samburu region, and in in because they had they had a really strong uh, monitoring and evaluation uh, infrastructure within that organization, uh, and so we were able to uh, maintain fidelity to the study design throughout, uh, and so we're you know we came up with what we felt were very robust results. Uh, the other site, not as much, although we got really good qualitative information from that site. Uh, so I'll be talking mainly about the Samburu results here. Um, as I said, the asset transfer was really seen by the funders and by the program designers uh, as the main thing that they were interested in. Uh, so all those parts of the graduation model that I had mentioned earlier, they were really keeping their eye on this one results page uh, throughout their, uh, you know, throughout the, the uh, results uh, reporting of this program. And so um, I think because of that, they were a little bit disappointed in these results. They were st statistically significant and we were able to um, to locate attribution of uh, increases in income with the programs, uh, with uh, the participants' experience of the programs. Uh, and so, but it just wasn't as great, I think, as a lot of people were hoping or expecting. But the ultimate outcome was that, uh, that you know, the people at baseline made about a uh, thousand uh, Kenya shillings in that month in the previous 30 days, more than they had uh, at the baseline. Uh, and so, uh, and about 700 of that was attributable to uh, the program activities. And so, um, so it was a significant result, but it, it wasn't something uh, that would make as big a difference as I think a lot of people wanted to a family of the average family size, which would, would have been four to six people. And so, um, but the, the area where uh, the program made sort of, uh, you know, had, had unmitigated success was uh, in terms of the savings. Now I had mentioned before they had created these savings groups 
uh, as in part to help people afford the National Hospital Insurance Fund cards uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, the, the participants in the program really took it to heart and uh, ended up saving uh, on average, some much more, some much less, uh, 134, what would amount to 134 US dollars by the end of the, the program, uh, which, was, which was really substantial after only 18 months of the program. And I think the, at that point, the, uh, the savings groups had only been in operation for about nine of those 18 months. And so, um, and people in the midline surveys, they talked a lot about uh, just having more of a culture of savings uh, and having never realized uh, that they could. And it, they attributed a lot to the mentorship that they received throughout the program uh, that they never thought about uh, for every hundred shillings that they got setting aside uh, 15 of that for future use. And so, um, so it, uh, some of that mentorship was eye-opening for the participants. Uh, some of the quotes that came out of those, uh, the midline uh, focus group discussions uh, talked about this difference in, in income, uh, but, but also refer to other aspects of, uh, of running a business and being a successful business person. Uh, they said, we can run a business and not just stay at home as before. So really speaking to uh, that targeting of women uh, and, and so most of the people that were responding in this way were women and uh, they were saying, you know, we, before we, uh, we, people thought of us as experts at only one thing and that was at, at home things. Uh, but now we can go out in the community, we can be seen as authorities uh, in the business arena and uh, as contributors to other aspects of society. This one is a much more straightforward quote, women have ventured into business uh, and they were very excited about that. Uh, much more so than just sheer amount of income, the, uh, if you disaggregate into the types of income that they were accruing, um, we find that at the, the inline, uh, there were declines in some areas and increases in other areas that were um, maybe not all that surprising for in some parts and, and very surprising at others. So uh, the treatment increased mainly in, uh, of course, the, the businesses that they had started as a result of the program. Uh, so that wasn't a surprise, uh, but also increased uh, in terms of long-term employment. Uh, this we differentiated from casual labor. And so, um, so a lot of people were, had been able to leverage either the skills, the experience, uh, or just the, the prestige from being a part of these programs into long-term employment. Uh, and so, uh, and then what we see that they're, you know, they had overall increases in income, but they actually declined uh, uh, making income in some of the areas that are deemed less desirable, for instance, charcoal and firewood. Uh, as you can see there, it was uh, one of the biggest declines and, uh, and charcoal and firewood gathering is illegal in Kenya, uh, although it's widely practiced and, and overlooked by law enforcement. Uh, and so people no longer uh, either wanted to or felt that they had to participate in certain types of income earning as a result, as a result of the program. Uh, so we expected when we asked people what was the most you know, beneficial aspect of this program, uh, because it had a lot of different components, we expected uh, wealth to be right up there. And it was uh, in terms of people's responses in the focus group discussions, uh, but health was also uh, always mentioned, sometimes first mentioned uh, among participants. Uh, and that could mean a lot of different things. So this is just number of mentions. These charts are showing number of mentions and focus group discussions um, in response to that question, but, um, but the health one contained a few subsections 
uh, and referred to one of three things. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, it could mean that uh, a change in attitude about the wash technologies. So um, this, this woman's talking about a, um, how previously it wasn't seen as a useful thing to boil water before drinking it or uh, to construct toilets. It's very expensive to construct pit latrines and, and a lot of people don't feel like they have the skills to be able to do it. Um, but now they're seeing worth uh, in that endeavor. And so uh, that was something that had changed uh, and they were enjoying it because they listed it as a big benefit of the program. Um, they were also referring, if they mentioned health benefits, they were referring to the health insurance card. Uh, and this one person says something that may uh, bring people back to uh, the uh, talk with David Citron a couple of weeks ago, uh, where uh, there is the sort of, uh, there are parallel systems, public systems, public health systems and private health systems. Same thing happens in Kenya. Uh, and so this person is really saying, look, I don't have to, I don't have to use the public systems anymore because I have uh, the health insurance card. Uh, and so they are able to choose their services and access what they see as higher quality uh, services as a result. Um, and then finally, people talked a lot about uh, an increase uh, in their diet and nutrition as a result of participation in the program. And, um, and that was either because they were earning more money and were able to afford better food or uh, as a result of training from the mentors about, uh, about how to manage household expenses and buy nutritious food. Uh, and so, um, so one woman said she started drinking milk tea from her goats. Uh, which she had never done before, and, um, and instead of selling it as part of the business. And so uh, this program really was, the mentorship aspect of this program was really key uh, in, in making sure that people weren't sacrificing parts, uh, parts of their well-being for other economic benefits, which is something that has been critiqued about a lot of the uh, livelihood programs I've seen in the past. Uh, they also had targeted as a, as a desired outcome of this program, um, the funders and BRAC included, um, had wanted empowerment to be a part of, uh, of what we were measuring in terms of outcomes. And we talked a lot about how to measure that. Uh, and we did in several different ways. Uh, but one of them was looking at people's confidence in joining uh, committees or in accessing social resources um, or, uh, or accessing some of those services that, uh, that the government was intending to connect uh, local people to, and especially in remote areas. Uh, and so uh, this is just a scale, uh, a Likert scale question that we asked people that there were significant increases for the treatment over the baseline. And, uh, and so we found uh, the biggest confidence increases came in the areas of uh, people being able to obtain a loan uh, if they needed one, which uh, is a big deal there as it is here. It's important to know people to be able, be able to get a loan. Uh, it's important to, uh, to have something uh, that you can leverage when getting a loan. So whether it's assets or uh, regular income. Uh, and, uh, and so a lot of people had confidence for those reasons uh, in being able to do that after the program had ended. Uh, joining local committees was another one. Uh, one of the things that kept coming up in the focus group discussions was, uh, was how much women that had been involved or that had been uh, selected as participants of the program were being invited to, uh, to join committees all of a sudden. Uh, and so they, and they kept saying it in the same way. They kept saying, we now have a voice in the public sphere. Uh, we now are able to speak uh, in public and at these meetings with some kind of authority. Uh, so again, being treated uh, as experts and as people who uh, know and contribute to the health of 
of the group. Uh, and so, and then finally, sending children to the right school. So being able to access the school resources uh, that they desired and needed. Uh, we also were looking at empowerment in terms of uh, household dynamics. So relationships between husbands and wives. And, um, and so, and we did measure this one on a Likert scale too. There were significant increases in decision-making power according to, uh, to the, the questionnaire that we designed. Uh, but I found the focus group discussions to be, uh, to be really enlightening about how it was doing that. Uh, so, the, uh, so they talked a lot in the section. We asked about changes within the home, uh, trying not to lead them in terms of, you know, between husbands and wives or anything. So they could talk about any changes within the home. Um, and they first and foremost, especially in the Boma area, mentioned men's attitude, um, but it was third on the list and in the care regions as well. Uh, and so what they were finding is that, uh, is that men were, were treating them different uh, and responding to them differently and accepting them in certain sectors differently. So more of what we were talking about in terms of social change as a part of uh, a change in livelihood. Um, and so some of these quotes show this uh, in a much better way than I can. Uh, it has increased peace and harmony between husbands and wives. And actually at the beginning of this, we were expecting there to be uh, a lot of talk and there was some talk of conflict in the home as a result of this because uh, we'd been hearing about uh, women who had uh, come into conflict with their husbands when they acquired more wealth than their husbands uh, through their businesses. And so, or, um, or running up against uh, men trying to overtake successful businesses once the women had gotten them up and running. Uh, and that did happen a little bit and, um, and was uh, combated by some you know, collaborations with local leaders. But, um, but for the most part, people talked more about uh, an increase in, in harmony and, 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 um, and, and this came about as more of a, um, a result of, again, that change and uh, women being seen as partners and uh, as having expertise to share. The other one said husbands are now requesting their wives take loans from the groups to care for family matters. This improves relationships between them. Uh, and this one says it even uh, better. There's an increase in love because everyone is contributing to income generation at home. And, um, and so far from just being contributors to the house and that having uh, an effect on the overall conflict le levels, um, there, were, there were a lot of discussions around, uh, around there being uh, women just feeling more confident and happy at home because they didn't have to ask for things. Uh, from their husbands, and uh, they weren't always in this position where they were, uh, where they were, they were helpless to access the things that they needed that were seen as part of their role, like childcare and sending their their kids to school and getting food for the family. Uh, and so they were more able to kind of tackle those in a proactive way. Uh, they felt. Uh, men and women are advising each other on matters concerning the family. Again, more of a partnership uh, within the household as opposed to what had preceded that. Uh, and this one is, is very East African for those of you with familiarity in this, in this region. Women are now called Inya and Ganya, mother of somebody, when before they were called by their names at home because before they brought nothing at home. Uh, and this uh, this is just, uh, it speaks to that uh, in, in Kenya, you know, both mothers and fathers are, uh, are almost always referred to in public as mama this or mama that, and that's, uh, you know, named after one of their children. So they're, they're known in relationship to one of their children. And, um, and so now they're saying that they're known 
uh, to their husbands as mother of somebody. Uh, so a sign of respect in that quote as well. Catherine, I just um, wanted to jump in and remind you of where we're up to on time. Okay. So Thanks. we're, yeah, getting into the Q&A period. Okay. Great, thank you for telling me. I will then uh, just kind of put the challenges out there. I've painted kind of a rosy picture of uh, this program and its results, but there were many, many challenges. Uh, it was very expensive to offer the kind of mentorship that I think made the program uh, the success that it was. Uh, and it wasn't quite long enough that so had been uh, unnaturally abbreviated uh, just from circumstances, uh, but it was also um, just supposed to be two years long. It only ended up being 18 months long uh, and people didn't feel like that was quite enough time. So, um, so it would have been a, a big expense to continue it, uh, but it would have uh, maybe been more worthwhile had it been longer. Uh, the help and economic delivery systems need to catch up to where, uh, where to meet people where they were. So, um, you know, the program was really trying to get women to access loans and, uh, and, to, and to get households to access the health resources that they were, that were supposed to be available to them, but they weren't always available to them. So there were still a lot of gaps uh, in what people were actually able to access with those in a, NHIF cards. Uh, and then finally, um, the exclusion of men was a point of contention. I think we're finding more and more in evaluation that even when your programs completely target women, uh, for instance, in reproductive health, uh, it really pays off to involve men in those conversations and, and in those programs uh, for their success. Um, and then there were ethical issues with the pilot. So I mentioned at the beginning that this was supposed to be expanded in future years. Well, they didn't end up doing that. And while we worked really hard not to, uh, not to make promises uh, to the comparison group, it, uh, it was a bitter disappointment that uh, they weren't going to be incorporated uh, into an expansion. Uh, so the programs did work on uh, sort of a, a, their own expansion of the program, but it wasn't uh, quite at the level that, uh, that had been perceived by the population. Uh, and it could have benefited as everything can from better planning, especially with uh, market and uh, the types of assets that were cho chosen, uh, as well as in the involvement of community leaders. Uh, so as I leave time for questions, I really want uh, to, I want people to feel free to ask questions about uh, the program itself, uh, our, you know, our design of the program, uh, but also I, you know, this program made me think a lot about uh, the role of the evaluator, both uh, in terms of, of the power or lack thereof uh, in negotiations with funding organizations and implementing partners, uh, uh, but also in international development in general, in terms of uh, especially a, a white woman coming over from, uh, from the US to lead an evaluation like this. And actually since this program, I've turned more towards uh, looking at capacity building when it comes to international development and global health uh, programs and trying to uh, gear my attentions there because of uh, from what I've observed, there are already so many uh, really uh, competent and, and uh, amazing evaluators in the regions where I typically have led evaluations like these. So there's really no reason for me to be doing that. Um, so yeah, I'd love to open it up for questions at this point. Sounds good. Thank you, Catherine. That was really interesting. And you did such a beautiful job of, of talking about the role of monitoring and evaluation, but also about um, showing everybody in the audience how laborious and sometimes tedious this kind of work can be and, and, um, and, uh, and I, but the importance of doing that laborious and tedious work in order to really 
understand what, you know, a lot of people in public health want to understand these days having to do with the social determinants of health. And um, you really did such a nice job of doing like a scene set for us of all of the different things that come into play when um, in, in influencing health outcomes and the way that people think, think about health and health seeking behavior, especially in a different cultural context like that. So thank you. I really appreciated that perspective that you brought. I'm wondering if there are folks on the call who would like to unmute themselves and pose a question or maybe if um, you feel shy or your connectivity is poor, you could just type it in the chat box and I would be happy to read your question aloud for um, everybody to benefit from. Hi, Kimber, it's Lee. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Lee. Hi, thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, you talked about the challenges of the never ending positive feedback and the, the enthusiasm that folks have on for the programs. And I'm just wondering, how did you, how did you like that? And I've seen that same in, in a lot of my work and it's like, it's hard sometimes to get a great grasp of what are we really doing wrong? Because it feels like all we hear is the great things that we're doing. So I was just wondering if how you got around that and maybe some of the questions that you, you know, you use to dig a little deeper. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lee. That's a great question. Um, so, and, and one I rethink every time I, I do something like this. Uh, and, uh, and so I talked a lot to the enumerators too about uh, how to phrase this part of the, uh, of the especially the focus group discussions. Uh, and so I think a couple of things help. It's, um, I was an external evaluator. Uh, and so, uh, and so we worked really hard with the, with both implementing partners to, uh, to have them never identify us as members of their team, uh, because they really wanted to do that. They wanted, they thought it would, you know, pave the way and, and help people open up to us. Uh, which it may have, but um, but we really uh, emphasized maintaining separation uh, for that very reason that uh, people might feel more likely to uh, to express uh, criticism if if they didn't see us if they didn't see their responses tied to their benefits, and so um, and I would also say I mean while I always try to do that it's almost never successful. <laughs> So um, that it can only be that can that part of it can only be successful to a certain extent. Uh, and then in Kenya, it's always about uh, phrasing it in the right way. I think um, in Kenya, people are are not averse to expressing criticism, but uh, but um, but never outright. You never, uh, you never approach those types of criticisms outright. So uh, if you give them the opportunity to uh, express those criticisms with the diplomacy that they uh, are so good at, that, um, then it really allows uh, for some more honest answers. And so we ended up uh, asking it in several different ways, asking uh, questions about if this were to be implemented elsewhere, then um, what should you know? What should another organization uh, do to make it really successful? Uh, and so, even not saying the word differently there, <laughs> but just saying what should they do uh, helped people to be able to express. Um, oh, okay. Well, they. Sh I have a lot of ideas about that, and and am willing to share those. Um, and then just asking a few different times. Uh, so, you know, uh, whether it's about uh, themselves or about their neighbors or about uh, maybe uh, also talking about rumors you've heard, you know, and, and relying on, on other people's knowledge. So, um, so you know, uh, some women have been saying X, Y, and Z about the organization. Uh, what do you think about that? And so uh, being able to, show them that they're not alone in criticizing the organization was, uh, was important too. 
Catherine, that was really interesting. Um, and we have, in addition to Lee's question, a question from Heather Bossi, which is, how were your key stakeholders identified and how did you keep them engaged through the challenging parts, especially the pilot? Um, that's a really good and a really good question. Um, do, in terms of the key stakeholders, at least in terms of targeting the participants, um, of course, we did uh, target uh, the ultra poor through those uh, those participatory rural appraisals. Um, but I really think that it it had to be through the constant engagement. I think this uh, this effort wasn't like I said at the beginning, it wasn't just an asset transfer, uh, but they they basically everyone was assigned a mentor. Uh, and so they had regular meetings with those mentors and um, and were able to uh, to stay involved and and even troubleshoot. I think that was a really key aspect of this program was uh, the ability to say, okay, this isn't working. And rather than, feeling like they had failed the organization or getting, um, you know, getting kicked out for not complying with the, the rules, they uh, were helped and supported in, uh, in changing their business or, or um, identifying the problem and, and addressing it. Uh, and so I think uh, that helped for the treatment. Uh, the comparison group in terms of staying engaged with the, uh, with the the inline uh, you know engage with the evaluation uh, that was really tough for the comparison to you know to keep the comparison group involved to find them again uh, for the most part people were willing to talk if we could find them um, but uh, but they were you know it was uh, difficult to find them if they didn't want to be found. And, um, and, uh, and then we'd lost, we'd simply lost track of, uh, of people they'd moved away. Uh, if there wasn't a thing like the program to keep them engaged in that community, that is one of the, one of the threats to that area uh, was, uh, was a lot of out migration, especially of men, uh, but also of whole families. And so they just moved away. And so that's why, especially in the one area, I didn't present those results because we didn't have a lot of uh, a lot of confidence in the in the results because we did have a lot of attrition uh, among the comparison group. So um, so it that was a real problem. Uh, the other group was able to have better. I had mentioned that they had a better monitoring and evaluation infrastructure within their organization to kind of keep people engaged. Uh, but they also had a more sustainable plan for how they would expand regardless of what the government decided to do with that pilot. So they knew that they were going to offer, they were able to promise benefits uh, to the comparison group. And I think that was a really key aspect of, of getting them to stick with it. Thanks, Catherine. And also Heather for that question. That was, um, again, really interesting. <laughs> Um, I wish we could keep you for longer, um, Catherine, but we have to be mindful of the time and people getting to appointments that they have at three. So I'm just going to plug our talk for next week on March 15th. Um, we'll be going back to East Africa and um, the seminar will be delivered by Anne Tizak, who has a master's degree in anthropology and an MPH and her husband, Martin Muganga, who um, joins, uh, they join us from Vanderbilt University, University Medical Center, and they are going to be talking about their work with a traditional healer organization based in uh, Uganda, where they met and married, and their talk is entitled Traditional Medicine and Traditional Healer Organizations in Uganda, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. So I hope you can all join us next week at 2 p.m. or catch the talk, which will be recorded and presented as always um, on our website. And um, again, Catherine, thank you so much. And um, thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks, Amber. <laughs>